Hi guys, so this week we are talking about fallibilism. This is the third and final uh, major answer we're looking at to uh, the problem of uncertainty. So we had infallibilists who say uh, knowledge requires certainty. Um, to know something, you must have a guarantee that it's true. Um, and you should only believe the things that you can be sure of. If you are uncertain, you should uh, get certain. The worry with that or a worry with that is that it leads to skepticism. Uh, I'll say why that's a worry in a second. The, the, that seems to lead to skepticism because uh, it turns out, um, the consensus now is, it's difficult to uh, achieve that kind of certainty, to get that kind of guarantee. Those, thing, the, those sorts of guarantees uh, are not available in abundance. So the worry is if we make the, the criteria for knowledge too strict, if we say you have to have this really impressive thing in order to have knowledge, then we wind up being stuck saying, you know very little or maybe nothing. Um, if we make the criteria for belief too strict, then we wind up uh, having too many questions where we wind up, uh, too, ma too many sort of uh, things you might wonder about where we wind up having to say, uh, you should just suspend judgment, you can't find the answer, there's nothing you should believe here. Okay, and that's that amounts to skepticism. One or both of those two things, either saying there's very little we know or saying there's very little you ought to believe. Um, that the, Those things count as skepticism. Okay, why is skepticism a problem? This is what we saw last week. Uh, well, the, I mean, I, I think maybe skepticism isn't a problem, but that's an advanced topic. Uh, the, the general thought though is, so on the, on the first kind of skepticism where we're saying, or sorry, the, the skepticism as an answer to this question one about uh, what you should believe in cases where you can't be certain, um, it's tough to live your life that way. So uh, one, one sort of objection to skepticism of this kind is to say, uh, you need lots of beliefs to get by in life. I would not be, I, I could not possibly have started recording this thing unless I had uh, some beliefs about, um, uh, first of all, how to do it, uh, what I need to do in order to plug in the, my um, camera and my microphone and the light, um, what application to start up uh, in order to record it, where I'm going to post it. Um, also, sort of beliefs about motivating kinds of things. Like I know that I, I believe, I have beliefs about uh, you guys who are counting on lecture videos this week for our classes. If I didn't have beliefs about those stuff, th those things, if I just said, well, who can say it's possible that we're all deceived by an evil demon and in fact there are no students in this class or that the students in this class would uh, prefer not to have a video and they'd be better off with no lectures. I'm not going to dwell on that thought. Uh, or maybe I'll think, you know, um, the, the broadcasting software that I'm using to record this uh, might not work or maybe something else is the way I do it. Maybe I should start up Steam instead. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that could be fine. If I'm just suspending judgment about those things, uh, I'm never gonna wind up taking any action. Okay, that's one kind of worry about skepticism. Um, another one is like, it's just implausible. Like if you say you should never have any beliefs about stuff, like go try and do that. Try and do that for a week, let's say, or a day, like, or for an hour. Just try to suspend judgment on everything. Maybe it takes a while to get into it. Maybe go for a week. That's hard. Like you wind up having opinions about stuff, super difficult. Okay, on the other hand, if we talk about uh, skepticism as an answer to the second question, the question about knowledge, it sometimes just seems like a mistake to say um, we don't know certain things. And I don't just mean that in a, um, I don't just mean that in a way of like, we seem to treat ourselves this way, but it, 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 here's, a, here's a kind of thing that makes it seem like a mistake. It seems like there is a real difference between, let's say, lucky guesses and knowledge. Right. It seems like there's a real difference between somebody who, uh, let's say, uh, has beliefs about <laughs> what's something that you might guess about. Uh, let's say um, somebody who knows that a certain horse is going to lose its race because they have inside information about like the horse is injured. Um, this hasn't been made public, but this horse is they're still in the race, but they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. Um, that seems like something somebody could know. Okay, difference. That was one case. Second case, somebody who uh, believes that Horace is going to lose the race um, just because they got a feeling or just because like they don't like the look of it or somebody who's guessing. Okay, so imagine a case where you've got this horse 
who's been injured, you have somebody who has inside information about it. The person who has the inside information, I think we can imagine, um, is in a better epistemic position, let's put it that way, is better justified, it, there's another way to put it, better justified in believing that the horse is going to win the race. And then we've got somebody else who just has a hunch that's, I'm, I'm going to assert, is based on nothing. Just this person gets feelings. Um, maybe they're like um, uh, addicted to gambling or something. That's the thing people do with horse races. Poor horses. Anyway, um, I think it's totally natural to say one person knew and the other person didn't. So like, if we imagine these two people now, not just as sort of like idle observers, but as being you know, in charge of deciding, is this horse going to be entered into the race? Um, if the person who just has a feeling that this horse is going to lose enters them into the race and puts them in a position where they might aggravate whatever injury it is, um, I, I don't think we'd be as angry at them as if the person who has inside information about the injury gets to decide this horse is going to run the race and the horse gets hurt. We can be mad at them. The reason why, extra mad, the reason why is we can say, you knew that this was dangerous. You knew this horse was going to get hurt. And you might worry that the skeptic is going to lose that for us. Now, you might want to say, um, the only real kind of knowledge, like knowledge with a capital K, that requires the kind of thing the infallibilists are after. I think a fallibilist can concede that. We might want to say there's different, there, you know, there are, let's say, two different kinds of ways of talking about knowledge. And one requires a guarantee. Like the thing that Descartes was after, having, you know, the uh, impossibility of being wrong in his beliefs. Like he can go ahead and call that knowledge. And that is a knowledgey thing that you can want. But there's also a more mundane kind of knowledge that is what we actually care about a lot of the time. When we get more mad at people for doing things that they know are dangerous, that doesn't have to be this kind of capital K infallibilist sort of knowledge. It's bad enough if you do something that you have very good reason to think is dangerous. And in fact, it was dangerous for the reasons that you had for thinking that it was dangerous. And then you did it anyway. That's worse than if you just sort of are, are guessing that maybe this is a bad idea. Yeah, okay, so that's the sort of thing we're gonna look at this week. So just to give you a sense of the rest of the uh, lectures and readings you're gonna get. Um, so I have already uploaded and I will um, uh, post a link to uh, a read through of that Gettier paper. Um, so, Gettier's, the, the examples in the Gettier paper are counterexamples to a certain analysis of knowledge. We're going to talk about what it means to analyze knowledge. Um, his examples only work if that analysis of knowledge is understood in a fallibilist way. So the problem that Gettier raises is a problem for fallibilists and not for infallibilists. We are reading this paper not because Gettier was the first person to come up with these sorts of things, these kinds of counterexamples that are now uh, standardly called Gettier cases. We'll talk, I'll, I'll put something up talking about the history of them, but there were, uh, there was at least um, uh, about 15 years earlier, Bertrand Russell had, post, had uh, published a case of this kind. And furthermore, uh, in the Indian tradition, uh, Indian philosophical tradition, um, the, the Gettier type cases go back much farther. So it's, it is strange to call them Gettier cases rather than like Dharmotera cases. Um, you'll see some of this discussed in the, in the Nagel book. Um, yeah, okay, we'll talk about that stuff. Um, we are going to, so, okay, we, we're reading Gettier because uh, when he published this little two uh, page thing in 1963, there was then in uh, Anglophone philosophy, a uh, massive, uh, explosion of responses to Gettier's paper, uh, attempts to repair the justified true belief analysis of knowledge. Um, consensus today is none of, the, none of those work. Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean knowledge can't be analyzed? Does that mean uh, just that we are all flawed creatures? What does that, is there anything? We'll talk a bit about that. We will talk also about some, some of those responses, um, in particular, uh, 
two distinct things due to uh, this fellow Alvin Goldman. So he had one theory in 1967, a causal theory, and then in 1966, uh, sorry, 1976, um, he decided, no, wait, I was wrong. There's a kind of case that my old theory can't handle. And then he um, advances this, uh, what's called a reliable list theory. And that's one of the sort of big headline types of theories of knowledge that's around today. You've got a paper by Linda Zagzebski arguing that not only has every attempt to, every attempt so far up to that point to repair the justified true belief analysis, not only have all of those failed, but in principle, any, uh, justified true belief plus X theory of knowledge, or rather true belief plus X theory of knowledge, analysis of knowledge is going to fail. If it is if it is fallibilist, you will always be able to come up with Gettier type cases, Darmaltera type cases, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then we have this paper from uh, somewhat later by William Lichen on the Gettier problem problem. That's not a typo. Uh, he's sort of reflecting on there's there comes to be after this explosion of responses to Gettier's tiny little paper. Um, after this explosion of responses and the the cons and once the consensus forms that none of them have really worked and they're all a lot of work to get through, uh, there comes to be this thought among a lot of philosophers that there was just something wrong with the project in the first place, like because so much of this stuff came out and because we didn't get a clear answer, we still haven't figured out what the right analysis of knowledge is, that there was something wrong with the project of trying to analyze knowledge in the first place. Um, and I like this paper of Likens um, arguing that, uh, you know, there's something funny about that. And actually the, the post Gettier um, enterprise uh, was worthwhile. Okay, those are the things you have to read. I'm all, I'll, I'll probably throw out some other stuff. I have lots of things that I'm uh, happy to lecture on this week, uh, more more than in previous weeks. You don't have to watch them all. Um, pick the things you're interested in. We will talk about whatever grabs your fancy in the tutorials. Uh, once again, you are required to read this thing. It's only two pages, two and a half pages, and then pick any two of these. Um, I will tell you the the two Goldman pieces get pretty heavy going. I will um, post some read throughs of parts of those. You don't have to do the whole thing, uh, but do go. Um, a little bit past where you get stuck. Get yourself stuck, try to turn your stuckness into a question and we'll talk about it. Try to push past that a bit. Push yourself a little. Sort of like if you're at the gym. I hear people go to gyms to exercise. That's like, oh, that sounds horrible. But I think it involves like pushing yourself a little bit past what feels comfortable so that you get a little stronger. Um, think if you're reading like that. These things are difficult. I know the Duton was difficult. I know some of the readings from last week were difficult. I'm giving you difficult things so we can work through them. That's how you get stronger. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.